What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up, man? Finally yeah. meeting after days and weeks of postponing. Yeah, man, I know. <laughs> I had a chance to check out your music. I see you do some stuff. Um, you've been. Uh, how would you describe your music? Um, how I would describe my music. I would say it's just a melody with a message, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, I try to make sure every song I drop is just saying something. It's, it's bringing something to people. So, you know, it's um, a lot of people say my style is a bit versatile because I rap, I sing, you know, and um, I switch it up a little bit. But most of all, if somebody asks me to describe my music, I just say music with a message because when it comes to the sound, I do all types of sounds, but I always make sure that... Sorry about that. I'll make sure the music is saying something. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, this week we have on the Top Form podcast David Lynn, who you just heard, the type of music that he does. He is he has Jamaican connections. He he lives in Miami and he's the brother of producer extraordinaire Easy Beats. Easy, are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Big up, Izzy, man. Yeah, Izzy um, Beats, um, he has been doing a lot of good work. And, and David Lynn is his brother that we have on the Top Form podcast today. And we're going to start from the beginning, David. So you just right. told me how you describe your music. But I want to know about your entry into music. Did you have a musical background? How did you start out in music? Um, well, actually, when I started out in music, most of my family, like, we didn't really have a musical background. Um, it was really one day, Izzy, he started messing around with a beat program. And then when Izzy just started, Izzy older than me, so when he just started playing and messing around with the beats, one day it was like a family party and we were all just running around. But Izzy was just, he was stuck on the computer trying to figure out, like, how the mic works and how everything works. So he was like, yo, David, come test out this mic thing for me. And then, you know, he was just like, you know, do whatever you want. Just I just need you to make noise so I can hear it in the mic. So while he's testing the mic, I started singing like a Michael Jackson song that I liked, you know. And then um, when he heard me singing, because I used to imitate, got like old videos. I used to imitate the Michael Jackson videos a lot. Just always trying to dance like him, sing like him. So um, when he put me on the mic, I just started singing some Michael Jackson songs. And this he was like, hold up. It was just like, damn, we might be on to something. And then, you know, that's when we tried to, like, start making our first songs and our first, you know, projects. How old were you at this time? At that time, man, I was, I want to say, like, 12, 13. And I didn't, like, at that time, it was more Izzy, you know? I had just came in, I messed with the mic, and I, I didn't really jump in yet but at like that moment let me know hey this is something i'm i'm good at this is something i like so you know that was like the big moment where i decided i liked it as something i wanted to do but i still you know took a little time before i actually dove in so so do you have influence um from jamaican culture and your music or your your straight american style hip-hop r&b singing Nah, not at all, man. Um, in my house, I mean, I grew up in Miami, but my household is all Jamaican. My mother, my pops. Um, I heard from a lot of Peter Tush growing up, um, a lot of Bob, a lot of, uh, man, I heard everything, bro. In our, in our house, you know what I'm saying? I grew up on the reggae vibes and um, also being from Miami, I heard the hip hop and stuff too. But, uh, you know, one of my biggest... I'd say, of course, Bob, you know, he's somebody I look up to. And uh, one of the reasons I try to make music with a message, because every song when I hear from him, you know, is something with a message, is something talking to people, really saying something important. That even when he's gone, you know what I'm saying, the songs say something. But, um, you know, uh, I would definitely say Vibes, Vibes Cartel. He's huge. I got to say yeah <laughs> don't know um, so so in in making music and having all these influences from peter tosh bob vibe starting that's a broad spectrum 
How do you translate that into the modern Miami music scene? Yeah, I, um, pretty much, man, on the Miami scene, Miami kind of has its own style with hip hop and everything. And I just fuse it. Like I said, me and Izzy, we literally been doing this music thing together. So our journey has been, you know, going up together. And uh, we would just find ways to like, you know, we would listen to a group of hip hop beats, then listen to a group of dance off. You know what I'm saying? And Izzy love, um, he loves playing like an alkaline or something like that. You know what I'm saying? What we'll vibe to that? And then kind of try to mix it with a Chris Brown vibe, you know? And I feel like at the end of the day, American culture takes from the Jamaican culture every day. Like people, as far as music, from reggaeton to everything you're hearing out there, people taking from us. So it's not hard to infuse reggae with anything or infuse dancehall with anything because most music is influenced by us anyways. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so making that switch, do you find that you have to turn it on, turn it off sometimes? And how, you do, how do you decide when you're going to make a song, a hip hop song versus a, a reggae song or a dancehall type song? How do you decide that? Um, well, I try my best because, you know, as far as the, the fans I, I, and my island fan base, I love because that's who's, you know what I'm saying, held me up. That's who's been, you know, pushing me. And um, I try to do it where people can still understand because what happened was me and the artist Popeye Caution, like I started dropping dancehall, like I was dropping a lot of dancehall. I'll say a couple of lines Jamaican, I'll say a couple of lines American, you get what I'm saying? Like I'll just try to balance it out in the song. But sometimes when I go too much, they're like, yo, we don't understand. So I'm like, All right, I, wanna, I want everybody to be able to vibe to the music. But um, that's a hard, that question is good because it's actually difficult to know how to balance it out. Yeah, so there's a lot of arguments about dancehall and hip hop and, and how dancehall is not selling, right? So, right. so for example, recently Butch Banton released his album and he went to number two on the reggae charts, but he only sold about 2,000 plus records. In, in hip hop, if you sell 2,000 records, that's that's a failure for for any yeah. record and buju is among our top act in reggae music so what i'm asking is why why would you as a young person enter the genre and one what would be your contribution to to taking the genre to another level in terms of sales and appeal to mass audiences right so when it comes to the genre, dancehall, is something that I've always pointed out, man, that I don't understand why a genre that leads an example does not lead in sales. Why is it the least? You know, it's not like we're, it's like, why are we so far behind? I look at even from Spanish artists, you know what I'm saying? And I try to understand why reggae artists, why dancehall artists are dropping their projects and it's not hitting. And I mean... It could be for a number of reasons, you know what I'm saying? But I feel like it relies on the, the labels and making sure that their artist gets a worldwide feeling. Also, I feel like, and because it, it's not the music, even if people don't understand the words, any record can go, a hit record is a hit record and it'll go worldwide, you know what I'm saying? But... um. I honestly feel like it relies on the labels or relies on the management because my experience in most of the dance hall records I've done, it's always no money. And that's what I, and that's something I realize. Every time I'd work in dance hall, there's no money. And then I'd look at some of these artists that are acting like they have much more than they have. But when you actually meet them and you're getting around them, you realizing, nah, you're supposed to be making more money than this or you know, this would be moving along a little bit more. So, you know, I, that's one of the reasons I don't, I try to find ways to use it and fuse it with the hip hop so that I could shine a better light on it. But um, I really think it relies on the labels, man. It relies on the, the management of these artists because I've run into many times where I had an opportunity to write with an artist, work with an artist, and um, the management is shady. And it's almost 90% of the time. Not even management, but just 
the whole dance all world, man. The whole the whole dance all world from going to the parties, promotion, like everything, man. It's just like I don't understand why why when it comes to the business side, things don't go the way they're supposed to, I'll say. You know, because Izzy, I'm not gonna say too much on it, but Izzy when he started his run out, you know, it was a lot of dance hall. We wasn't seeing nothing from that. Izzy got records with Vibes Cartel out here. You know what I'm saying? Izzy got records like, you know, so we were looking like, what's going on? You know, so um, with that, why the record sales are slow, I'm going to try my best to contribute because in the future as I move up, you know, um, I want to help other artists in any way I can to move up and be shown in the right way. But I feel like there's a lot of dancehall artists that should have been much bigger than they are now. Should have way better sales and it's not necessary. I know some of them because of the visa, you know what I'm saying? I know things get in the way. I understand that. But I just feel like if they get the right team and when I talk to the artists, it's like everybody's running in the same circle with the same people. You know what I'm saying? So I just think that it, the labels in Jamaica or the, the management with these artists, we just need somebody to create, or not even so much, we need more labels to create a better platform for dancehall. Don't promote dancehall in just the dancehall lane. Promote dancehall everywhere. Promote reggae everywhere. Don't just leave me in this one lane because everybody like this music. You know what I'm saying? So promote it that way. So I honestly think it's on the labels, man. I'm still on the language. Do you think the language has been a barrier also? Um, I think for some artists, it is a barrier because it's like Alkaline's amazing. You know, he's an amazing lyricist and Alkaline is dope. You know, I did a show opening up for him and uh, he killed it. But I just realized like the way he's spitting, even though for me, I could jam to it. I could listen to it all day. For the other person, it's like, I can listen to it one time and think it's cool, but then if I don't, you know, if you're not understanding what he's saying with PopCon, it's a little bit easier, you know what I'm saying? People could pick up on the lyrics, but I think the language is um, yes and no, because I hear Spanish songs all the time that I don't understand the lyrics in a Spanish song. German. <laughs> yeah, and I'm jamming to that Spanish song, so I don't know. I don't think I don't think it's the language barrier either because we make amazing music, man. We do like these artists. When I look at them, they're amazing artists, man. And I all the time, I'm like, they need more. They need more uh, exposure. Not even and then, yeah, they're famous. Yeah, they're doing shows. Yeah, but it's like they're not getting the same look as these other artists, and it don't make sense to me. It don't make no sense to me, man. So I think that just. Do you, do you see, who, who have you worked with, first of all? Who um, artists have you worked with? Look, both Jamaicans and, and other acts. Um, well, right now, I'm, today, a single's dropping. Shouts out to Ebony Jade. Um, she's an artist, a young artist coming out now. Uh, Coffee on, and Gunna. I worked on the W record. Um, Meaning you recorded on it or you produced you pr you no, produce, producing and writing. Producing and writing. Cool. cool. Um, and also, uh, I mean, it's just so many. <laughs> it's a lot. Like, from Charlie Blacks to we were hitting up a Beanie Man to, um, man, there's so many names. And then pretty much when you look down the list uh, with Izzy, and, of course, Izzy opening the doors, open doors for me as well as a writer and I've been working along with everybody with him. Um, but, oh, Taurus Riley, you know, me and him actually have a song coming out together soon. That's going to be a single for me. Um, but the problem is COVID. We want to shoot the video in Jamaica, but this COVID thing is a little crazy. So, mm -hmm. um, man, it's just- Who would you, who would you like to work with? You, you work with a lot of people. Who would you like to work with? Right now? Um, one of the people I think I would really like to work with, there's a lot, so I'm trying to think of like a, a specific name. Um, I think I want to, as far as a writer or as an artist? Anybody, it, anybody. Like producing anybody. Like who's, who's your ideal creative to collaborate with? Oh, my ideal creative is Kanye West. 
<laughs> somebody that, yeah, man. It's crazy as Kanye gets, man. When it comes to music, Kanye West is a musical genius. So that's somebody I really want to get in with. Like, I want to be in the studio with him and just create. You know what I'm saying? Just pick his brain. Mm -hmm. but yeah. Did you, did you grow up in Jamaica or you grew up in Miami? Um, I grew up in Miami, but always back and forth. But yeah, I did grow up in Miami. That's why I talk Jamaica because I, you know what I'm saying? I do, but it's just where I don't, I know some people who like will be in Miami and it's like, it's a problem if you, or they didn't grow up in Jamaica, but they try and pretend and act like they did. And it's like, I don't got to do that. You know what I'm saying? People know me on myself. I'll be real, you know, and, um. I, yeah, my, I grew up in I grew up in Miami, but you know my whole family in Jamaica. My my parents have been back and forth there nonstop, you know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I see a lot of people from Miami or from New York, and they they, you know, they they grew they know where they grew, and you can talk it like y'all walk on my yeah, dude. But it's just like I don't do it all day. It's not how I talk every day, you know. My parents, yeah, most of the time you probably hear me talking like that, but outside I talk like this, you know. At what point will you say that you've made it in the music industry? Hmm. What point will I say I made it in the industry when I got a top 10? When I get a top 10, David, you see my name, like David Lynn, got a top 10 on the billboard. That's when I feel like I made it. <laughs> That's my goal. Do you think you have the song right now? Um, yeah. Yeah, man, I feel like I got a song called Go On For Money, the one I, I got with Taurus Riley. We haven't released it yet, mm -hmm. but um, I really feel like that's a big, big record, man. I feel like that's, that's going to make some noise. Go On For Money. Go On For Money. I and saw she go on for money. <laughs> that's produced by Izzy Beats? Um, that's produced by Izzy and Neri. So Neri Beats and Izzy Beats. Okay. I'm looking yeah. at your, your Pandora streams right now, and you have like 37,000 a month going on. Do you keep up with the streaming platforms and, and, and make sure you're plugged into that on a, on a business sense? And how important do you think that is for new artists coming up? Um, I do, definitely. Now, I'll, say the, I'll tell you the truth, because I'm a pretty transparent person. Um, before... I might not have been paying attention to it as much. Now, in the last year and a half, I have my, my management. Uh, Shouts out to my manager, Ron. Um, like, he really started showing me to pay attention to certain things. And now, every day, I'm checking streams. Like, now it's like, okay, I got to make sure I get these up. This is where the money's at, you know? And um, But I'll say, like, within the last year, I really stepped it up. And I really learned a lot this past year when it comes to handling my business the right way and just making sure I do things correctly, you know? Mm -hmm. And pay attention to the numbers that I need to pay attention to. And, and what's your, um, what's your current, well, how would you say you have managed to penetrate markets using streaming? Like, where's your greatest audience? Jamaica or Miami or New York? Um, well, a lot of times, now, Jamaica is a, a big part of my, my audience. Um, but also, I'll say Miami, definitely, and um, Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a big part of my fan. Yeah, I just realized that with my, I had a song, Manners. I was looking at the stream for my song, Manners, and I saw that the majority was coming from Costa Rica. And then I ran into a uh, couple people hit me up to do a show out there. They're like, yo, you bigger than you think out here. Like, people be jamming in your songs. And I was just like, yeah, all right. So I've been I've been waiting to kind of explore. Reggae music. reggae music has a big following in Costa Rica, and it, it probably started years ago because Marcus Garvey um, yeah. put up shop in Costa Rica way back in the days with wow. the NIA and, and 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 the Garvey movement. So Costa Rica does have a big following. So so that's that's what I'm trying to get to in in penetrating different markets. What do you realize the differences are in terms of your music consumption? Um, as far as just comparing to... Uh, for example, I see you have a, a, a Black Lives Matter video. Right. That Black Lives Matter video is one of your highest streaming videos, right? Right. 
so it it's it has penetrated markets beyond your niche which is oh, okay. the, the reggae um dance hall miami yeah. scene because if right. you look on your youtube you see persons that discovered you of spotify and, and such just off that video alone so what i'm trying to say is by using streaming and plugging into current affairs do you find that you're able to stretch out the market and and make your music connect to more people is that an accurate observation yeah that's extremely accurate like when it comes to that um the response you get because now it's like people reaching out because they really feel it because you could drop a love song and everything and they feel that you know but when you touch on something that people are a little bit uncomfortable to talk about and you give people a chance to really hear it in a way and it's expressed and they can say i can relate to that like the amount of messages i've been getting you know i've dropped songs but i've never had newspapers doing write-ups on me and all of that this is the first for me so yeah it's been uh it's definitely reached way beyond what i'm used to like, and i'm sure you didn't do it because of that but why did you do it why did you decide black lives matter and do the video in such a a, a, a pointing way where you know it, it kind of begs for some kind of emotions to be evoked yeah well, i did it that way man because it just happened to me multiple times like uh people have been around me whether it be on the music team they've seen it happen to me whether it just be my friends when they've been with me I, as far as you know police shooting tasers at me cuffing me up for no reason um the last incident I had was last year and I was in LA and uh, we were at Guitar Center. We were at the studio and Izzy was like, yo, I got to go pick up something um, for the guitar. I said, all right. He went to go get it. Then while Izzy's out there, while Izzy going in the Guitar Center, I'm just sitting in the car chilling, you know, police pull up to the car. I'm just, just like, um, I need you to come out. You're being detained. I said, for what? What did I do? He said, just relax and come out. You're being detained. And then he, uh, you know, I was going to argue with him, which I should have said my rights, but I know the reality. You know what I'm saying? I know regardless of whether I'm right or wrong, you pull that gun, I'm done. You know what I'm saying? I'm, and then afterwards, you can explain yourself, but I'm still gone, you know? So he took me out of the car. He emptied my whole book bag all on the, just emptied everything. And um, I didn't have anything. He had no reason. I said, what's your reason? And he said, um, you're suspected for murder. So murder, I just came in town. I was like, murder, you know, you hear that? You're like, and um, he said that you match a description. So the, he leaves me in the car. A couple people come by and talk like, why are you holding him in there? Then afterwards, they say, yeah, there was a murder the night before, but we don't have a description of anything. So I was just like, yo, you just told me I fit the description and that's why you held me, you know? I didn't fit any description. You just held me. You just came, searched my book bag, hoping you were going to find something. You took me out in the car. And you know what I'm saying? It's embarrassing, too, because this is in the middle, you know, in the middle of the plaza. And it's just like, man, literally for sitting down, for sitting down in a car. I can't sit down in a car and just feel cool. You know what I'm saying? You told me I look suspicious because I'm sitting in a car. And not only that, you know, something as serious as murder. So it's just like, you know what it is to tell an innocent person, like, I'm suspecting you of murder and you have no reason to, like, you're just playing with my life, like, it don't matter. You just, like, it's nothing to them. And that's where the anger comes from, you know? And then the, the anger is really just in, in that moment, feeling helpless, feeling like, I know he's wrong, but I can't say, take it. I just got to sit quiet and let it happen. You know, and that's why in the video, you know, I'm handcuffed. I'm on a car because I'm helpless, you know, and the cop is wrong. He's overdoing it. He's going and I can't get out of it. So it was just showing pretty much when you're in that situation, the emotions that you're feeling, the thoughts you're going through, you know, the things that I'm really thinking in my head, even though I didn't get to say it. But yeah. Do you think racism is connected to classism in Jamaica? Um, is racism connected to classism? Is it the same thing or is it totally different? Nah, racism, I feel like racism stems from hate. 
classism stems more from ego, from, uh, yeah, hate, but racism is a hateful thing. Racism is, I don't like you because of the color of your skin, where you come from. Classism is more so, you know, feeling better. Some feeling better than others, some feeling, you know, and, um, and classism. Isn't that, isn't that the same thing with, with racism where white people feel like they're better than black people? That's true too. You're actually right. <laughs> You're actually right. Yeah. But I, at, I get the subtle differences that you're saying because what what I'm thinking about is just like racism functions and and it's systematized through police and other structures to oppress certain people. It's the same way in a country like Jamaica and and, and even Africa and other places where black people are the majority, but they're treated like the minority. Yeah. There are certain people who find themselves with the power, which the power means money. They're able to influence policy. They're inf able to influence businesses and, and, and the good neighborhoods are reserved for them. And the, everything happens in a particular way in one side of town, but in the other side of town, which is no less than no more than 10 miles away, you right. find the ghetto. In Jamaica, you can drive for every five miles. Yeah. You the ghetto the right next to a, a suburb, you know? Um, yeah. And, and the, the two live in different circumstances. And people do feel oppressed. Uh, not, maybe not as extreme as in America, but you do have people who experience um, joblessness because of where they live. They don't get hired because they live in a particular community. So yeah. that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get at to see if there's some kind of commonality there. Because what I don't see, that, yeah, I mean, what I don't see in recent times, like how oh, you attack the Black Lives Matter issue, mm -hmm. not a lot of artists in Jamaica are focused on the oppression of the people. It's almost, it's almost like you said, everybody acting richer than they are. Everybody acting more privileged than they are. They're not speaking for the people. And yeah. there, there, there's a disconnect happening between what people are really experiencing and what the artists are singing about. And I think there's a lane for that. Just like how you managed to find some success with that Black Lives Matter song. There is a lane for that. And I'm challenging even you to, to examine that issue as an artist and... See how you exactly. can be the voice of the people. Definitely. Um, that's something I'm going to, I'll definitely be bringing up amongst artists that I'm with too. Um, and I'll, I've said that in circles and studios, what you just said, because one of the things, sometimes people are not me, but it's the truth. And I'll be like, yo, with the dance hall, we make fun. We're making a lot of fun songs right now. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, the wine and bubble, all that stuff. The topics are monolithic. Exactly. And it's like, it's the same thing over and over and over and over. And I tell them, because I'm a writer, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yo, something got to switch up at this point, man. It's like everybody just trying to get a quick hit, writing the same thing over and over and over. And it's like, one of the things we've been known for is speaking out against oppression. I'm talking about going back, you know what I'm saying? And it's like with the new generation, we're slowly just losing it. So I think that the subject matter with dance all with, it, it needs to step up big time. That's something I agree a hundred percent. Cause it's like, I want to hear this, you know what I'm saying? And I know that they got songs where they talk about how it is in the streets and all that. And that's cool. That's going on too. That's a reflection of real life. But um, yeah, like you said, with the oppression, music is powerful. Music is sometimes going to reach the people who aren't going to take the time to watch a video. who are not going to take the time to go and read an article or who aren't going to take the time to learn a little history. That song you make, that two minute, three minutes, if you can manage to fit the message in there, you're going to reach that person that would have never read that article. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I think you're 100% right on that. that, that talking, song. About, talking about feeling the music. Buja Bantan said in an interview recently that the new artists are not making songs that you can feel. Mm -hmm. um, the, the songs are, are very surfaced and... They don't have the feeling element. Do you think he's right, one? And do you think the music has moved on from 
the old style and it is just being embraced in a different way now? I was saying that, you know, many artists that are dropping right now, I feel like I have heard, you know, songs with feeling, but it's not much of it. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not, it should be much more artists that's giving you that type of music than we're getting right now. But I wouldn't say none of the new artists are giving songs with feeling. Like there's a lot of great artists out right now. Um, and then there's a lot of artists on the rise, on the come up that people don't know that are um, dropping a lot of music like that. But yeah, as far as the artists who have the platform right now, the majority, let's say, let's say 70% are just dropping the same thing, you know? And then you got another 30% that's dropping some songs of feeling, but we need to expand that. It needs to be much bigger. It needs to be more people. Yeah. And the last question I'm going to ask you is, what is your opinion about um, culture vulturing, um, cultural appropriation, people yeah. as you say, using dancehall, reggae music to build their catalogs and in many instances not given back. BET recently had an award show and there was no there weren't any representation of reggae dancehall on the entire show. So what do you think yeah. about that? Um, I Where think that's to go? I think that's something that people need to start speaking up about big time. Because I see so many, especially in America, I see so many, even outside of just, you know, different races that are celebrated and their successes with music are celebrated. And I, that is something on BET that I want to be seeing. That is something, but I feel like we just need more people speaking up for it. But because the genre is not as strong as it should be right now, I feel like there's not enough voices to speak up. And hopefully, God willing, you know, I make it to a place where I could really speak up and say something. Um, I spoke to Izzy about it, but um, my opinion as far as when I look and I don't like, you just saying as far as people not culture vultures, like people taking from it, like Sia, she did a song with Sean Paul. And well, she, well, well, Sia did the song with Sean Paul and gave Sean Paul credit. There are people who do songs with artists and don't give them no credit at all. Um, Jay-Z Jay -Z did a song called The Black Effect with Beyonce and Lantern at Stein's who is a choreographer. She, it's actually, when I listen to the album, the album encompasses everything she said. Right. And, and they didn't even give her a credit on the album. She's now suing Jay-Z and Beyonce for her rights. Um, yeah. yeah. Acknowledged as an artist. And, and this happens a lot where artists come and record and take the energy from the artists here in Jamaica and they don't give them credit. Yeah, and especially sometimes when you're working with big artists, uh, labels do um, try to big boy you sometimes and just say, oh, we'll put your name or we'll, you know, we'll put, it, put your name somewhere down here, but it's not gonna be when we post a song, you know? They do that all the time and that's wrong. I think that uh, she's smart for fighting for that and she deserves to be recognized. She really does, because. Um, and as for BET and the Grammys. BET and the Grammys, well, the Grammys, I don't make a big deal of the Grammys sometimes, man. I know a lot of people do. And I, I love, like, my brother Izzy just got a Grammy. I'm, I'm happy. I'm thankful. You know, I think it's a beautiful thing. But um, when I look at the Grammys and who they, like, they just have a small table of people making these decisions. And um, it's just where I don't see how those people can define if a song is supposed to be the best R&B or best reggae. For so many years, I was talking to Walsh Fire about this. So many years, it's just been a Marley. You know what I'm saying? In the, in the Grammys. And it's just like every year, it's a different Marley. And I was like, you guys ain't really listening to what's going on in the reggae world or the dance hall. You just, they're going off the family name, picking the same thing over and over again. So, you know, I don't weigh in, at least when it comes to BET, the fans weigh in on that. But um, BET, they need to just step it up and they need to put a platform specifically for dancehall. Dancehall needs to be a very respected genre. There needs to be performances from more dancehall artists. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't feel like I see enough big dancehall performances. When I watch a BT Awards and I see Chris Brown and this person, I want to see Popcorn too. You know what I'm saying? I want to see somebody come up and do the big shows, the big award. And I know we get some, you know what I'm saying? But it's not all the time. It's not everywhere. And it needs to be all the time. We need to be recognized in every single award show. But yeah. I feel you. I feel you. David Lynn, thank you so much. This is the Top Form Podcast. And I appreciate you coming on, boss. And we'll talk, all right? Big up. Yeah, man. I appreciate it. All right. Blessings.